Hello, listener. This episode of the LabVIEW Experiment podcast is not like our typical show. Today, Sam talks with Andrea Goulet, who is best known for making empathy accessible to analytical skeptics who code. Andrea and Sam talk about how empathy-driven coding practices are the way of the future. We hope you enjoy. Welcome to the LabVIEW Experiment. I am your host, Sam Taggart from SAS Workshops. In my 15 years of working with and training developers, I've had the opportunity to conduct a lot of experiments. Over here, we believe in embracing failure as the essential learning experience that it is. And what better way to learn than from other people's mistakes? In this podcast, I talk to industry experts, colleagues, and friends about their failures and how they have turned them into future successes. So I am here today with Andrea Goulet. Uh, you may know Andrea because she spoke at the GLA Summit. She gave one of our keynotes. Uh, and it was a talk about empathy. So why don't we start with that? And you, know, you go over the whole presentation, but just give us like the Cliff Notes version of that presentation. Yeah, it's actually one that has been very popular. So it's called Empathy is a Technical Skill. Um, which a lot of times I present at software conferences, agile conferences, and I always get people who come in, they're like, what? I thought empathy was all about intuition and emotions. Um, but kind of my purpose is I want to be able to operationalize empathy so that it's we can map it out schematically, just like we would with software. And we can understand it kind of on a systems level, because when you start to look at it that way, it's surprising just how much there is in common with how we develop and maintain software systems. Um, there's actually an underlying architecture that uh, neuroscientist Jean Decity from the University of Chicago has mapped out. And so there's functional areas in our brain um, that contribute to different aspects of empathy. So those are, I call them care, calm, consider, connect because the overall um, scientific words are a little bit hard for me to remember. But um, care is what's called empathic concern. It's also called compassion. It's the foundation of all empathy. Compassion is what powers empathy. And compassion is a heartfelt and action-oriented response to suffering. So compassion is a response to suffering. And instead of feeling distressed by it or pulling back, you lean towards it. Um, and that can be hard a lot of times because if we're tired or we're sick or we don't know how, you know, if we're not practiced in it, if we have habits, you know, learning how to work in that way is important. Calm is emotional regulation. So this is being able to calm yourself down so that you can think <laughs> and communicate in a way that is coherent and it expresses things and you're able to have dialogues um, and that uh, that becomes critical for the next piece which is consider this is called cognitive empathy and this is your logic this is deliberate so there's empathy is kind of like breathing where there's an automatic component you can go your whole day with never even thinking about it but you can also be very deliberate so the empathy that I talk about is the deliberative empathy so let's say that we're doing a code review. You could just like bang it out and like not even think of anybody or who's going to read it. Or you can be really intentional and think about, okay, who's going to read this? How can I make sure that uh, my ideas are going to be understood kind of for posterity? So somebody who I don't even know yet might come on my team and wants to get context. Um, and then the last one is connect. So that is what's called affective empathy. And there's a synchronization between emotions and being able to kind of align your emotional state with another. And when all four of those components are kind of in balance, or in balance, not imbalanced, <laughs> when all four of those components are in balance, then that's what effective empathy is. So being able to map out kind of, you know, similar to, you know, how we describe healthy code, right? It's, uh, you know, it's easy to read. It, uh, you know, we measure cyclomonic complexity and duplication and churn and kind of all of these different things. And those are kind of the components that we think of when we think of healthy code. Um, 
And, you know, empathy is kind of the same way. There's all of these different components, but it's a system because all of those different things interact with each other. Um, and that's just kind of the tip of the iceberg. So, yeah, I've been really, really fascinated in how can we take empathy out of the realm of intuition and kind of magic, if you will, where it's just this, like, you either have it or you don't, um, because the research shows that everyone has empathy. It's just, there's kind of a stereotypical way to express it. Um, and we can absolutely map it out in a way that is accessible to people who are more analytical thinkers rather than kind of make decisions based off of intuition. Yeah. I think it's probably also muscle memory, right? All those little skills. Mm -hmm practice if you practice them then you get better at them and they become more automatic yeah absolutely yeah i describe it that like empathy happens in micro moments that matter so being able to recognize like oh this is a situation where i could apply empathy and there's so many more of them than you think i have this one slide and it's like even logging messages or you know error messages or um you know, code reviews, commit messages, variable names, all of those different things are places where you can pause and think about the developers that are going to come after you, the developers you're currently working with, how you should interpret work that came before you that you're working on. Um, so, and then once you start to, you know, identify opportunities in the code, you can also look for opportunities within yourself. So self-empathy is really important, being compassionate to yourself when you make a mistake, um, recognizing that you're a distinct and autonomous uh, boundary. Like there's a there's like a self-concept. And uh, so we want to make sure that that boundary exists because if we enmesh ourselves too much in another person, then empathy can kind of go awry, um, which I'm just fascinated by because like in domain driven design for example like a bounded context is a really important thing and we set boundary conditions within the code same thing happens with empathy um and then you can think of uh other individuals that you're connected to that you're having kind of an interpersonal dialogue with that's kind of where we think empathy happens but it can also happen asynchronously um, and then also thinking of it on the systems level. So empathy in a group, so in a team, in an organization, in a community, but then also how do those groups interact? Um, so when you, when you start to map all this out, it's just really fascinating and it starts to make sense to me. <laughs> so I hope it makes sense to other people too. No, oh, yeah, I, I really like it. Yeah, your message about error handling, I think, uh, I just ran into that the other day. I was talking to somebody and they had some code. Like, yeah, this weird number, but I have no idea what it means. And it's kind of cryptic. And so being able to explain that and put it in more meaningful terms, because it's mm -hmm. a thing to do. Yeah. There's an economist, Daniel Kahneman. I think he wrote a book, Thinking Fast and Slow, where um, he kind of pulled in two different ways that we think about things. So there is system one, which is more process oriented. It's slower. So he uses the metaphor, if you're driving in a car, like you run through a mental checklist um, where, you know, is my mirror on? Do I have my seatbelt on? And you start to kind of build a routine. Um, and then over time, that becomes so habitual that you don't have to put as much cognitive effort into it. You just kind of go on autopilot. And so that system too. And, you know, so with empathy, it's kind of the same thing. We can just go throughout our day and kind of operate as we think we should. Um, but also being able to be deliberate when we recognize that we're in a situation that could benefit from having empathy, but we're not quite as sure in how to um, apply it because we just haven't practiced it or, you know, it's a proficiency that we need to get better at. Yeah, that's very good stuff. So if people want to learn more about this, they can go see your GLA Summit video because we just finally posted. Mm -hmm. It did. Yeah. Want it there. So uh, we have a YouTube channel. Okay. Um, so one of the things that you, you gave a presentation after the GLA Summit on communicating with non-tech people, and I thought that was actually a really useful uh, tool because I feel like 
as developers, oftentimes we're mired in the technical details, but we don't necessarily understand the bigger picture concerns, the business concerns, et cetera. And we need to figure out how to be able to communicate. For example, one of my big things is figuring out how to sell your ideas. If you have an idea of how to do something better, but it requires some effort or some budget or something, and you go to your boss, you say, hey, we should do this great thing. And they just say, well, what's the business case? And, right? and, and when I first started out, that used to always shut me down because I was like, I don't know. I never thought about the business case. I just thought, you know, this sounds like a better idea. Right? And so how do you... How do you then have the empathy to understand what they're thinking, what they're concerned about, what they're getting measured on, and what their goals are, and figure out how to align with us? So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it starts with getting that understanding, right? So, you know, working with people who need that and getting to know them as individuals, if you can. Sometimes you can't, because it's like, oh, I'm writing for the CEO, but I've never met them. Um, but one of the things you can do there is kind of think of like uh, what are CEOs or business-minded people likely to want, right? So return on investment, talking about risk, you know, thinking about things in those terms, you know, that's the thing that they really value. So for example, if you're saying, I want to uh, increase our um, automated test suite, it's like, okay, why? <laughs> like what's the benefit so yeah there's a um, old saying from back when I started uh in sales actually and it's what's in it for me so being able to like just think about things and frame things in that way and um yeah one of the really cool things is that I discovered is that the way that we the way that we understand and the, the framework that we use to get a bit of information from one computer to another um, is the exact same way that is, it's literally the same model of how we get information from one human to another. Um, so it's called the Shannon Weaver model. And so Claude Shannon was crazy foundational in the field of computer science. Uh, he actually was, what'd you say, Sam? And electrical engineering. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So he was the person who was like, you know what, if we have to build a circuit board just to test it, that kind of seems silly. There's this algebra called Boolean algebra. I think that that could apply here. So he actually also coined the term bit, I believe. And uh, yeah, he did some work um, at Bell Labs and that was his whole focus. And so if you read his paper, it's pretty math heavy, but one of the key relationships in there is the um, relationship between entropy and compression. So entropy is the amount of uncertainty and compression is how short can you make something? How, how much can you condense the information? And so there's an inverse relationship. So in places where there's high uncertainty, the clearer way to communicate and the way that your message is more likely to get across is Actually, if you don't try to compress it as much and you give more explanation. So an example that I use in terms of human communication is acronyms. So, you know, on this show, I'm pretty sure I couldn't say TDD. And most people know I mean test room development, right? Um, if I go to my mother, she's going to have no idea what I'm talking about. Um if you work with somebody who's in marketing or customer service, you know, it's really important for development teams to collaborate with those departments. But if we use kind of this condensed jargon, because there is higher entropy, there's a lack of understanding in the receiver, then being able to explain things, and it's going to take more words, but it's going to be more clear. So, you know, for example, um, if you're collaborating with someone in marketing or, you know, someone who's deciding on budgets, you know, you can describe things in term like TDD and saying, we're going to test the code before we actually write the code. And this has several benefits, right? It allows us to make sure that, you know, it's like an insurance policy where if we make a mistake, we've caught it really early. Um, it helps us 
um, make sure that we're testing things. Ultimately, it makes the code base easier to change and that's going to make your life easier. So it's going to be really beneficial in the long run. Um, and once we've all learned it, you know, it becomes a habit and it doesn't add as much time, you know, actually can save time. So that's like a long explanation, but I'm talking about the benefits of the why, like we would want to do this. And that tends to be something that gets across. And again, you're using that Gannon Weaver model and the relationship between entropy and compression. And it's like, that's, it's literally the same model. <laughs> it's not like a derivative of or inspired by, it is the same model. So. I wonder if that's why there's so much confusion on Twitter, because it, it forces you to compress things. Because I see a lot of chatter on Twitter, oh. and oftentimes people are talking about really nuanced things, and they put out this clickbait, yeah. and then it kind of goes off the rails because there is no nuance there, and everybody has right. understanding. Yeah, and that's the thing; it can be really challenging. So there's actually a um, article from NPR, and it was someone who did their thesis on like scientific communication and how much information can you compress. And that was exactly what they found was that you lose so much nuance when you try to condense things that when your whole point is to describe the nuance, it kind of just makes things really confusing. So there are times where the nuance is necessary and even beneficial and being able to notice kind of when, and I think the, the big key there is entropy. Sam. Well, another thought that popped in my head is that sometimes the, the medium forces you to compress stuff because Twitter, it's compressed into text, right? There's so much communication mm -hmm. that is nonverbal, tone of voice. Like, it's really hard to tell somebody's being sarcastic or joking around. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like, that was hard for me. Like, when I started looking at, like, Stack Overflow when I was first learning how to code, there was a lot of sarcasm on there. And I just thought, like people were being really mean and I didn't understand the culture. Um, there were people who were flat out being mean, right? And, yeah. but I think a lot of times it's trying to be sarcastic, but at the same time, recognizing that, mm -hmm. that your intentions don't always come across. So like if I'm with my best friend and like we go walking twice a week, and she knows that my personality is, I'm not a necessarily sarcastic person, but like, if that's kind of who I am, then it can actually create bonds where it's like, haha, we have this almost inside joke and I, and I know you're not being serious. So we've, there's less entropy there, but when you're publicly saying something and it's really compressed and you also have a lot of entropy, like that makes it so it's just rife for misunderstandings. Yeah. 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 Like the entropy is kind of like the noise in the system, right? Like I, I think of like yeah. relationships with people, like the, all this underlying stuff that exists, like, uh, yeah, to background stuff that then affects the communication as it's traveling along the channel. Right? I think about yeah, absolutely. And like one of the ways you can think about it is that, um, you know, when you're getting a bit of information just from the, uh, computer to computer, um, you're, you really only have an information channel, right? Like it's just about bits and bytes and like, are they assembling themselves in the correct order? Um, but one modification that I think is helpful is to take the kind of channel and split it into two with humans where you have both the content channel, you have the information that you're trying to convey. You also have the relationship channel. So, you know, who am I talking to? Am I certain that I understand what their needs are? Um, you know, how much interaction have I had? You know, how much, how is our relationship tense or, you know, uh, relaxed where we, we know each other? Um, how much trust do we have? So taking those kinds of things into account as you're putting your messages together is really helpful. And that comes from understanding how to apply empathy and looking at it in kind of more of a nuanced and schematic way. So, so uh, if people want to learn more about these things, where can they go to find out more? Oh, that's such a good question. So I'm currently writing a book um, called Empathy Driven Software Development. It'll be published with Pearson. Um, 
it's taken me, I, I've been working on it for two years because as I started to learn it, like the research that has come out in the past five years completely upended my understanding of empathy. And, you know, my background is in sales and marketing. So when, when I got my degree in strategic communications too, like empathy was a very technical skill in that domain, like you had to understand it. Um, and so I thought I knew what empathy was, but then as I started diving into the details, there's some really foundational things that really changed the way I look at empathy. But the good side is that it also maps better to the way that we build software. Um, so if you go to my, uh, so I started a company as well, um, Heartware. So we've got software, hardware, and hardware. Um, and so our domain is hardware.dev. Um, because there's a medical device that, uh, as hardware.com. Um, yeah, so that's kind of, I'm putting out courses and, um, content and there's a link on there to sign up for updates about the book. Um, yeah. And I have also, uh, publish kind of a long form article about once a month on LinkedIn. Um, so you can follow me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm not active on Twitter. I'm on Mastodon, but not super active there. And then um, also uh, Empathy in Tech, which is you're helping on the leadership team, which is fantastic. And so there we give um, kind of monthly hour-long free workshops just to kind of get the information out there. So um, yeah, so the technical communication, if you wanted to watch that video, it's available publicly on uh, empathy and tech YouTube channel, but you can also go to empathy in tech.com and we have all the videos there. Okay. Very cool. Yeah, definitely worth watching. I sat through that. It was very good. So thank you. Well, also, you should know too, uh, for the empathy and tech, there is a discord channel as well. Yes, there is. That's another, uh, platform I struggle with, <laughs> but yeah, there is. So, and it's great. And we now have uh, bi-weekly meetups there as well. So talk to people. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It's very good. This episode of the LabVIEW Experiment podcast is brought to you by LIDS. LIDS. Because if you didn't have LIDS on your coffee cups, how many times would you have replaced your ergonomic keyboard by now? Thanks, LIDS. The way that I actually met you was through Legacy Code Rocks. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Because that also has a, a community around it. Yeah. So the way that I got into software was um, I had started working for myself at 25. I had, before that, I had a job in sales where I like basically took this database and created all these boolean searches and all these templates and just like built this kind of engine in the database that just let things run um and i ended up in less than a year becoming the number three sales rep in the nation and people were like what the heck are you doing i was like i'm just using the tool it was called apt so i'm like i'm i just got the user manual on reddit and implemented some stuff um and then after that, I decided that I really wanted to work for myself. So I worked with um, clients like chiropractors offices and things like that to help them implement kind of what I had done. And so I had a blog at that point where I was describing the work that I was doing and kind of how I approached content. And so a friend of mine from high school at our 10-year reunion um, picked up, uh, he had a startup, his name's Scott Ford. Um, and so he... Uh, told me that he had been looking for a CEO because he wanted to be a co-founder, but he really wanted someone who knew how to run a business. And so he was like, I want you to be my CEO. And I was like, what? I don't even code. I don't know why, like what qualifies me. And, uh, you know, he said that, you know, he knew me from high school and he thought we would be a good fit in working together. But then also he described how the way that I approached content development was actually programming. Like you're taking input, like information from businesses 
you're putting it into this system where you have operations and then you're getting a result and kind of an output. And he's like, at its core, that's what programming is. I was like, oh, interesting. So I joined um, and was learning. We He was really focused on agile and XP practices. So I had just a steep learning curve, but I really liked it. Um, and so we focus on, I mean, Corey Bikes is still around. So we that's the name of the company. And we focus on making things better. So taking existing code bases and improving them instead of building them from scratch. And in that process, and so that's kind of where I am now with hardware, where being able to bring all these amazing people together to solve bigger and larger problems. Um, so, yeah, it's it's been fun. I'm not uh, hosting the podcast as much as I did. Um, in the beginning, Scott's kind of taken that over, but yeah, it's a, I like it. I think it's a good community of, and Scott describes the meetups as, you know, kind of like therapy for people who are working on legacy code, because, you know, it can be frustrating if you're the only person in there who sees the value, but everybody else is like, "Ah, no, what's the point? Let's just tear it all down. Yeah. I saw a presentation. I think it was I may have been you or may have been Scott. I think it was either you or both of you, but uh, on making versus mending. Do you remember that? Yeah, I've given several talks on that. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's kind of the idea is there's not one that's better than the other, similar to how there's extroverts and introverts. Um, And it kind of exists on a spectrum where it's like some people are both makers and menders. Like, you know, they kind of, you know, straddle the divide. Um. But it's it's just a way to kind of identify as somebody who's part of a community um, where, you know, people who, you know, tend to really like taking something and like, like if there's a bug, like chasing it down and being like incredibly deliberate, incredibly persistent, like really keen on the details. Um, whereas makers, I, I'm definitely a maker where it's like, okay, here's an 80s percent solution. I'm done. Bye. And you need both in order to make good software. Um, but culturally, we lionize the makers and the extroverts, right? Whereas, you know, we we tend to not recognize the value of kind of more of the the work that goes beyond behind the scenes, which is just as valuable. So yeah, that's kind of a way to just help people identify you know kind of what they enjoy and then meet other people who are in that camp but it's not staying there it's being able to work with other people and see their value too yeah it definitely is a spectrum i feel like people tend to gravitate to one side or the other but definitely there's a spectrum i think one of the interesting things that popped into my head is this thought that like our society seems to think that the only creative act is creating new things but sometimes i think yeah when you're vending stuff is actually like it forces you to be even more creative because there's all these limitations. Mm-hmm. I mean, you've got this existing Absolutely. And so it forces you to try things that if you're writing it from scratch, you may not consider doing that. So that's an interesting thought. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of relationships between constraints and creativity. So you're, you're spot on. And that makes me think we were featured in a book called The Innovation Delusion uh, by, um, oh my gosh, Andy, I can't remember his last name. Andrew. Oh, I'm so embarrassed. Um, but yeah, the the idea there, it's actually the more, uh, it's outside of the software industry too, but kind of let's, you know, this was published several years ago, but the idea is this make that move fast and break things kind of culture um, can be really dangerous if we only focus on the new things and we don't maintain and you know, pay attention to infrastructure or, you know, the plumbing or, you know, the electrical situation in a house or, you know, those things are critical, but we tend to just ignore it because it's like, eh, nobody's going to see it. We don't think about it. And I think that's a lot of the same thing with software modernization and maintenance where it's just not top of mind, but 
when you do pay attention, then things last longer. You end up getting a much higher return on your investment. Yeah, but culturally, we kind of lionize this idea of innovation and diminish the value of maintenance. Yeah, I call it the magpie syndrome, chasing shiny objects. We, we tend to do that. Ah, yeah. But I, I wonder, though, does the system reinforce that, though? Because I think a lot of the problem with developers is that, you know, technology changes. And if you're maintaining an old code base and you want to stay relevant, right? Because you're thinking, oh, you know, I'm only going to work here for yeah. I have to move on, right? And the system encourages that because, you know, if you stay at the same company, they only give you a couple percent raise every year and you jump ship and you get the 20% raise or something. Right? So it encourages yeah. people to chase those shiny things. Yeah. Well, I think also kind of the venture capital infrastructure too, um, you know, there, there tends to be more of a bias towards inventing something new that's going to disrupt everything. Or the, um, they so... AI. Yeah. 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 And I think it's, I mean, it's not to abandon those things, but it's just a recognition that, you know, you can reinvent things. Like if you think about an old house, like this is kind of where Scott got the idea for this term software remodeling, right? Where you have people who build new houses and new construction, right? But eventually the infrastructure in there is going to fail. Now, so he redid a whole night, he had a Victorian house. It was like 1910, it was built. And so he had gone in and renovated it, but he didn't use the tools that were only available in 1910. He used power tools. He used, you know, pressure treated lumber and like modern things. And so it's really about modernizing. It's not a... Let me keep it in this existing, like, time-locked state. Because if you think about it, like, um, your body, for example, it reinvents itself all the time. Like, your your gut, the cells in your gut are replenished, like, every month. Your bones are cellularly replaced every seven years. There's actually very few places in our, it's like a few places in our brains and our eyes that kind of don't change from birth. And so I think of that in a similar way to a software system. So you've got like kernels, kernel aspects of the code where you're, yeah, that's really not going to change, right? But UI, like that's going to change all the time, like which frameworks you use. And so you can like part of what we've done at Corgibytes is taking some of these systems that are on, you know, kind of older platforms or frameworks or languages and then migrating them to something that's modern. But the key is that you don't disrupt the existing system. So you're constantly able to fulfill your business needs instead of doing hard cutoff. Because like our bodies don't go to sleep one day and then our consciousness is transferred into a different corporeal form, right? It's, it's this act of just ongoing uh, reinvigoration and changing. And ideally, that's what you see in a software system, too where things are constantly changing and updating. But if you were to say, oh, this is, um, there's actually the ship of Theseus paradox, where they would send out this ship in Greece to commemorate this battle. But over the years, they had to replace each one of the boards and things like that. So after, you know, 100 years or so, every single board had been replaced on this ship. So the question is like, is that ship still the original ship? Because none of the original things are there. And that's very similar to, you know, how we maintain and modernize software. It's still usable the whole time, but um, but it's also constantly being maintained and updated. So Yeah, that's a big rewrite versus refactor debate. And I very much yep. I have wavered all along those lines throughout my career. I'm very much in the refactoring camp now, exactly like you say. And I think yeah. back to some of our previous uh, conversations about selling it to people, I think it's much easier to sell the refactor because in terms of risk, it's much lower, right? Because it's much lower. Yeah. It's one board, right? But if you said, I'm going to tear this whole side off and put it back, well, then you've got nothing until you get it all back together. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think the bias there is that you have people who are used to managing projects. Like, it took me a long time to really understand Agile. 
because like I was used to, like I went to school and like learned how to manage projects using Gantt charts and like, you know, <laughs> mapping things out. And um, there was a book called Team of Teams and it really mapped things out that there's a difference between a complicated system and a complex system. Um, so a complex system is much more dynamic um, and it's difficult to predict the emergent behavior. Whereas, you know, it's more of like a process. It's not really a system where, you know, you put in X raw materials, you run it through Y process and you get Z product. And so that function, like if you've got a like assembly line or something like that, general process can be optimized and works fairly well. But when you're in a situation like software where there are just so many dependencies and, you know, that's when you really have to, you know, kind of let go of this need of certainty and, you know, just in time and things like that. And you just have to approach things in a different way. Um, and I mean, there are times when a rewrite makes sense. I mean, like we had one client where that was actually our advice because the CTO it was a startup. And so the CTO had come in and written everything in an outdated technology because that's what they were used to. And so the CEO was like, I don't understand why I can't hire developers. And it was like, they were relatively early in their, you know, kind of journey of become, but the CTO quit. Um, and she was like, what do I do? And so we were like, rewrite everything in Angular and like, you know, react and use kind of these modern frameworks because that's what people who are coming out of school now are going to be more familiar with they're not going to be using web form anymore like so that was what we suggested and so they got in a new cto who built everything from scratch and that was the right decision in that moment and for that specific context but for a lot of context you know we advise to rewrite it's pretty pretty rare so i feel like rewrite works if the if the program's in its infancy is is one stage and also, if it doesn't work, because sometimes I've had people who hire something and they get it like halfway and like, but it doesn't work. And it's like, well, there's, yeah, there's a lot of value in a program that's been around for a while and doing its stuff. But if it hasn't been around for a while and it hasn't been actually doing anything valuable, then there's not a lot. Mm -hmm. in yeah, absolutely. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that's a very interesting topic. Yeah, there's always going to be debates on that and there's always... uh but yeah, I'm definitely firmly on the side of, uh, I feel like even in the situations where you have something that needs to be written, I feel like the act of trying to refactor it first gives you a lot of valuable insight into what it's actually doing and how it's structured. And, and I so I feel like my, my advice to everybody is almost always like try to refactor it and see where you get and mm -hmm. maybe it'll work. And if it doesn't work, at least then you've you've never wasted that time. You've learned a lot about how the program works. Yeah. I, I forget whether it's Arlo Belshi or um, Llewellyn Falco who introduced the read by the refactoring um, method. And so that's like the way you want exactly what you described, like the way that you best can learn to understand a system is by trying to refactor it and make it better because it forces you to like really get in there and learn. Whereas if you're just kind of reading passively, you're not getting that integration. Cool. So I'm going to speak to our lab you friends for a minute and, and it's just if they'll resonate with them that you might not get this, but I inherited a program once and it had a whole bunch of like nested sequence structures and stacked sequence structures and stuff. And I literally just took it and uh, refactored it and just inlined all the sequence structures so that you could see it all at, at once. So it'd be the equivalent of like, you know, it's got way too many, like it's got super deep function calls. And so you just like basically get rid of all the function calls and put everything in one method just so you can look at it in, in one file. And, and I found that actually really, really helpful. And then you could start like taking, the, like, you know, like if, for example, some of the functions are very cohesive and they just kind of seem haphazardly put together. If you put them all in one method and then re-extract the functions, then, then it makes more sense. That makes me think of like KonMari and like the way the Marie Kondo suggests organizing a house where it's like you, get everything and put it into the room and it looks crazy messy like we wouldn't like you probably wouldn't want to have that huge method in a you know like you're only keeping it there because then you've got it in chaos and it's really hard to maintain but by seeing everything kind of on the floor all at once then you can very easily 
organize things and group things together and it makes more sense. So but yeah. that is a challenging refactor. Sometimes it gets worse before it gets better. Like for example, I have one project from oh. finger to another and I'm like ha halfway in between, right? So I've moved some of the modules over, but not all of them. And now somebody picked this up, they'd be like, this guy's crazy. He's using these two different frameworks and right. But th there is a method to the madness and eventually it will get better. But by taking those mm -hmm. small steps, you kind of, some of those intermediate spots where you end up, it's still functional, but it's it's not in the optimal state yet. And so it's just having right. with yourself and, and being able to tolerate that little, because the, the other solution is just throw it away and start over. And that, that that's very rarely works out well. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah. If your kitchen is messy, you don't like destroy the whole kitchen and start over. Some people do because like there can be times where it's like that just makes the most sense. But it's like if you just have dirty dishes, you yeah. don't tend to remodel your entire kitchen. Um, you know, but yeah, I think I think I love the metaphors. I love like thinking about the associations between how we do things in one domain and like how that's similar to other domains. Um, yeah, and I think that kind of helps with the communication too. Metaphor is such a great way to kind of help get your your um, your ideas across, especially to someone who may not be as familiar with kind of the jargon that you're used to. So, yeah, I could talk about this for days. Yeah, I could. I do. Fortunately, uh, we've got an uh, empathy and tech uh Present presentation, I guess, would be the correct word. Event. Yeah. Going Workshop, out. event. Yeah. So, so yeah, uh, I've got to go to that in about 10 minutes. So uh, I think we'll end it there, but uh, we'll throw a bunch of information in the show notes for everybody's listening, give you tons of links to follow Andrea and all the cool stuff she's doing. And uh, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. That's yeah. great.